Hi, this is Dr. John Bergsma for the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville. Here we are, let's remember why we're here, to praise and worship the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, that he may be better known and loved, and many may come to have salvation through him. That's the purpose of our whole lives, right? So that's why we're here, reflecting on his word today. We're in the, the second to the last day of the liturgical calendar here. Tomorrow will be the last day. So this is the penultimate day. There's a word for your vocabulary. Yesterday was the anti-penultimate day. The day before was the pro-anti-penultimate. Anyway, we won't go. It's kind of indefinite how far you can go with that. But anyway, so we're in the penultimate day of the liturgical year. And uh, we have these great readings from Revelation and the Gospel of Luke. So uh, let's jump right into Revelation 20. It's getting really good. You know, remember, we began the scriptures with a wedding in a garden. It was Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden. And now we're coming up on concluding the scriptures with a wedding in a garden city. Okay, it's going to be the garden city of the New Jerusalem with the Tree of Life around the river of life at its very center. Those are images from the Garden of Eden that come to rest in the heavenly Jerusalem. And there's the wedding of the lamb and his bride. And uh, we're at, at the end of today's reading, we're going to get introduced to the bride there. But anyway, I, uh, let's read this. I, John, saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the abyss and a heavy chain. He seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, which is the devil or Satan, and tied it up for a thousand years and threw it into the abyss. This is an inter, uh, intra-biblical reference back to the serpent in the garden in Genesis 3. Um, in, in, uh, so those of you that follow Dr. Hahn know the Hebrew word nachash or serpent can have a wide range of meaning. Here, uh, John is under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, is interpreting Nahash as a dragon, as a great serpent, and then uh, identifying that great serpent as the devil or Satan, the original tempter. Okay, uh, And now he ties up d the devil for a thousand years and throws, it, throws him into the abyss. Uh, we locked it over it and sealed so that it could no longer lead the nations astray, the dragon that is, until the thousand years are completed, and after this it is to be released for a short time. Now, one of the things we need to rec re uh, remember about reading the book of Revelation is that it is sometimes dischronologized. Not all of the visions in the book of Revelation are meant to be taken as a sequence of events that will unfold in the, uh, in the last days. There are what we call dyschronologizations, which are like jumping forward and jumping back. We all know this from movies. Maybe you've seen a time travel movie uh, like The Lake House with Sandra Bullock or Inception or something like this, where you're jumping around between planes of reality or between uh, you know, the past and the future. The book of Revelation is very much like that. Uh, sometimes you have flashbacks to earlier uh, episodes in salvation history. For example, in Revelation, you're looking up in heaven and you see the ark of God revealed in heaven. And then you have a flashback to the birth of Christ in Revelation 12, where the woman who is in one sense, the blessed mother as queen of the people of God is uh, in the pangs of birth for this male child, right? So you flash backwards to the birth of Christ and so on. So you jump around and in the, the, in the church's mainstream tradition, this binding of the serpent for a thousand years has been seen as the binding of Satan during the age of the church. How is he bound? He's bound through the sacraments. Um, you know, all, all the sacraments have exorcistic uh, properties to them. We see it most especially in baptism and confession. And then, of course, there's a solemn rite of exorcism. But the fact that the church exercises the sacraments or celebrates the sacraments and is able to do exorcisms is a sign of the church's kingship over Satan and a sign that Satan is bound during the age of the church if the church will exercise herself and claim her authority over Satan. 
So, uh, and then what is this uh, unleashing of the dragon uh, for a short time uh, at the end of the thousand years? This is a sort of rampage during a brief period that we call the Great Tribulation that will immediately precede uh, the end of human history and the return of Christ. So that is, that is standard Catholic eschatology teaching on the end times. Um, uh, uh, that, is, that has been upheld over the ages. And uh, then John writes, uh, I saw thrones. Those who sat on them were entrusted with judgment. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and the word of God. Okay, those are martyrs, early martyrs. The, the, interestingly, beheading was uh, the punishment for citizens. So um, John is writing at a time when already... There were converts from among Roman citizens who, rather than being crucified like Jews were, were being beheaded uh, for their martyrdom. And John sees their souls and presumably the souls of other martyrs as well, um, uh, coming to life and reigning with Christ during a thousand years. So the saints are reigning with our Lord during this age of the church, and we ask for the intercessions of the saints as they reign with, with Christ in heaven. Uh, next, I saw a large white throne and one who was sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, the great, and the lowly standing before the throne, and scrolls were opened. Then another scroll was opened, the book of life. The dead were judged according to their deeds by what was written in the scrolls. The sea gave up its dead. Then death and Hades gave up their dead. All the dead were judged according to their deeds the second time. Okay, so be careful. We're not saved by faith alone. Our deeds are also important in our salvation. Twice, John says, we will be judged by our deeds. Does that mean that we earn our way to heaven? Not at all. Any good deed we do is only the activity of the Holy Spirit in us. We have no credit for that, but we need to be docile to the moving of the Holy Spirit and allow the, the Holy Spirit to transform our actions and our behaviors so that we can be judged as righteous when we stand before God. This is a, uh, is a picture of the, uh, the general judgment, okay, not the particular judgment. When we die, we'll have a judgment before God immediately, but then there will be a general judgment at the end of time, the, also sometimes called the final judgment, etc. It goes by other terms as well, where um, all persons who have lived will be gathered and we will see each other's judgments and we will publicly witness the saints vindicated and... Um, the wicked uh, receiving their just uh, punishment uh, before the before the witness before the eyes of the whole universe. Okay, that's uh, that's the general judgment. The sea gave up its dead, etc. Okay, um, death and Hades are finally thrown into the pool of fire. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the pool of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Why no more sea? As I said in, in previous episodes, the sea to the Hebrew mind is it represents chaos and uh, the forces of evil. And so just like standing on the sea denotes victory over the forces of chaos, the absence of the sea means uh, no more do the forces of evil and destruction threaten uh, the peace and the harmony of God's kingdom. And he says, I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. What a beautiful image. And so we are ushered in here near the end of Revelation 20 into this nuptial imagery of the wedding feast of the Lamb. Heaven is going to be so good that it's compared to one of the best things in life which is marriage and the happy union uh, and loving union of man and wife together. That is a representation of the blessed union between ourselves as God's people and his bride and God himself. It's going to be like a wedding embrace one day. Beautiful thing. Let's comfort ourselves. Uh, let's comfort each other. Let's encourage ourselves with, uh, with that hope. Uh, a hope for something that will come, and that is true. Now, let's jump down to the gospel. Jesus told his, his disciples a parable. Consider the fig tree and all the other trees. When their buds burst open, you see for yourself, and you know that summer is now near. 
In the same way, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Amen, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Well, you say, but we're still here 2,000 years later, and all these things have not been fulfilled. Well, I would say, no, they were uh, truly fulfilled even within that first generation from Jesus, within the span of a generation, which is, by biblical chronology, 40 years. Okay, So in less than 40 years from our Lord's uh, resurrection, um, a judgment fell on the earthly city of Jerusalem, a terrible judgment. I'm listening to it, by the way, right now. I have an audio uh, recording of... Uh, Josephus's Jewish War. Josephus is a famous historian, a contemporary of St. Paul, who witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem and wrote an extensive history about the events leading up to it. And uh, I don't have the time to read it all, but I got a lot of time in the car, so I'm listening to it. And uh, oh my goodness, it was an awful time. And many of the plagues and the crises and the disasters that are spoken of in the book of Revelation literally were actualized on the city of Jerusalem in the years leading up to the destruction and capture of the city of Jerusalem in the year 70. And that was a foretaste and a type, an image of the final judgment where what happened to the earthly Jerusalem will happen to the whole earth. And then our Lord will come and uh, history will uh, be finished. Uh, in, AD, in the A.D. 70, the earthly temple, the, the old Jewish temple of the Old Covenant was destroyed and it was replaced by the Temple of Living Stones, which is the Christian church. Uh, and in the final judgment, uh, this earth, which is a great macro temple, um, is going to be uh, destroyed and we're going to have a new heavens, a new earth. And we are going to uh, share with God in his presence. And uh, St. John says that there is no temple in the heavenly Jerusalem. But from a different sense, that whole city is going to be the temple. The entire church triumphant is going to be the new temple of God in the age to come. Well, we could talk about these things extensively. But what is the point here? Jesus says, watch for the signs. And I believe that not only... Uh, was there a foretaste of the final judgment in the year 70 when that great judgment fell on Jerusalem? But there are smaller foretastes and s smaller experiences of the end times and of tribulation as the church moves throughout uh, human history. And in any given moment, tribulations seem often to be on the horizon, and then oftentimes we, we go through them as well. And it's natural in these times to expect that the second coming is near, and in a sense it is. And when we look around ourselves, we see the signs of tribulation and um, uh, atheism and um, uh, violence and hatred toward the church manifested in any number of ways. And it feels like things could degenerate very quickly, very soon. I don't know if this is going to be a small tribulation or the last tribulation, but regardless, our attitude should be the same, that of wakefulness and watchfulness, an alertness that describes a life of prayer rather than a life of giving in to pleasure and sensual indulgence. So let's keep that vigilance of prayer, talking to God on a daily basis, conversing with Christ about what our vocation should be, where we should apply our efforts, where his spirit is leading us to act and to bless those around us and to work for his kingdom. And let's stay in communication with our Lord uh, about the end that is coming and continually ask him to strengthen us so that when that end comes, we can stand firm and not be ashamed at that uh, general judgment that we spoke about and that was pictured for us in the first reading. Well, this has been Dr. John Bergsworth from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville. Until next time, God bless you richly.